Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the DNA structure and then the replication of DNA, an important process that we have discussed in the bulk before when we discussed uh, mitosis and uh, meiosis and how those, uh, those processes required the, D the chromosomes to become doubled. Um, and now we're going to be getting into the nitty gritty details of how this happens. So last time I think we missed out on a little bit of detail here as to what this final structure was at the end of the day after that after Watson and Crick and uh, Rosalind Franklin and Wilkins all finished their work. What they decided upon was that DNA was known at, was in a double helix structure. This is a structure that looks kind of like a twisted ladder. On the along the outside of the ladder there are two strong strongly bonded um, groups of elements here. There's a pho the phosphate group uh, joins up with a sugar molecule and then that sugar molecule joins up with another phosphate group which joins up with another sugar molecule joins up with another phosphate group etc. So we have a, uh, a sugar phosphate combo combined with another phosphate sugar combo phosphate sugar and this becomes what's known as the sugar phosphate backbone. Now if you number out the carbons on the sugar, remember I mentioned very carefully that it is a five sh carbon sugar, one, two, three, four, five. The fifth carbon is connected to the phosphate group and then that phosphate group is going to connect to the third carbon of the next group. So the, there's always a, for each nucleotide, this is a, nu a single nucleotide here. So that's a nucleotide, tide. and so that, that's the discrete unit that makes up the DNA strand is this, uh, well maybe we'll just block out the whole thing. So this is one nucleotide, we discussed that in the previous booklet, uh, previous lesson, and there are two carbons that are important. There is the third carbon of the, of the nucleotide and the fifth carbon. And the fifth carbon nucleotide connects to the phosphate of that nucleotide. And the third carbon connects to the phosphate of the previous nucleotide. And so in this way, we end up with a situation where the third and the fifth carbon join the sugars together through these phosphates into a continuous strand, a continuous backbone of DNA, of DNA nucleotides. And this also applies to RNA. RNA is also set up in the same three to five uh, way. Now what happens is that interestingly, the, uh, the base pairs are organized opposite to each other. So this organization means that the, the phosphate's backbones go in opposite directions. So this side goes in a three to five, three prime to five prime going down and this direction is going to be five prime and three prime, three prime to five prime going up. Prime is just a label that we use to know that we're talking about a carbon in a organic chemical structure. So this is just a organic chemistry uh, terminology that's been adapted by these biochemists. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of anything that deals with uh, living chemicals or chemicals in living cells. So the DNA molecule is two long chains of nucleotides. This is what makes it, that's what also causes it to be called a double stranded molecule. And they're bound together in the shape of a double helix. And so here is the helix. This is a, a helix shape. This is what, uh, what uh, Rosalind Franklin had sort of almost accidentally discovered in her, uh, in her image 51 um, was this helix shape of the, of the rungs of these, sh these bases. And so in the middle here of the nucleic acid, we have the base pairing. So these are the Chargaff rules, the adenines across from the thymines, the cytosines across from the guanines, three hydrogen bonds between guanines and cytosines, two hydrogen bonds between adenines and thymines. So these are the uh, nucleic bases, bases, base pairs. And so these paired nitrogenous bases, they can be thought of as the rungs of the ladder. The alternate sugar and phosphates form the two sides of the, the, two sides of the ladder 
the two supports of the ladder. And these strands run opposite to each other, so we call this anti-parallel when they run in opposite directions. And this is going to be very important in one minute because we're going to be starting to talk about replication. And replication uh, is a directional thing, and so that means that the two sides of the DNA strand are in opposite directions, which affects how replication can go. Re replication turns out to be only able to happen in one direction, and so when the strands go in opposite directions, it causes some problems. Um, and so we've already talked about this. The 3 to 5 prime is going to be a labeling system we're going to concern ourselves with. And I should probably have written them in the proper, I should probably put my arrows in the proper way. 5 to 3 and 5 to 3. We're always going to be talking about, the, about reading the DNA strand in the 5 to 3 direction. And we're probably going to be creating DNA in the 3 to 5 direction. We'll explain that in a second. Here's a little bit of a closer model. Um, this is a nicer model. It's closer to the organic model that we uh, need to discuss. We might need to visualize. Here's what a phosphate group looks like. You can see these oxygens here that are able to hook up the, the sugars to each other. And you can even see that the sugars are in opposite directions. Sugar has an oxygen at the, at the top of the molecule. And you can see that the tops of the molecules are in different directions here. And what else can we see from this? Here, this is, chem this is carbon number five. This is carbon number three. Here is carbon number three, carbon number five. Carbon number five is actually not in the ring. That's also why it's number five. It's not, as, it's not considered as important when it comes to numbering because it's outside of the ring. And then you can see the hydrogen bonds, which are used for organizing the DNA strands, making sure that the pairs are matched. Uh, here you can see what it would look like if you filled in the space with the electrons that uh, that each of the elements has, and it would not be a it would not be so loose. There would not be there's no space in the DNA strand. It has uh, it's filled with electron density. Okay, so there are going to be three processes we're going to discuss. The first process, process number one, is going to be DNA replication. And to do DNA replication, we need to think about that molecule we just discussed. So in order for one cell to become two cells through mitosis, the cell must double the amount of DNA molecules in it before division. This is during the late interphase or mid-interphase stage. This occurs in all living organisms, although different enzymes are used in bacteria to do this process. So we are focusing on the eukaryotic uh, system. Um, and it is done before mitosis and meiosis uh, during interphase. DNA replication is considered semi-conservative, and there's a really cool experiment that involved a bunch of, a bunch of radioactive labeling, where they radioactively labeled some DNA and they watched how the radiation spread through the, through, the, um, through the group of bacteria. And anyways, the conclusion that they got out of this experiment is that every single new cell has half of the molecules from the original uh, cell and half of the molecules and half of the DNA molecule is from a is new DNA. So when forming two daughter DNA molecules, one of the parent DNA strands is passed directly to each daughter, while the other strand, the complementary strand, is newly formed. And this is uh, what that looks like. So here on the right, we can see this is before interphase, before interphase. And, one, and this is a DNA molecule. This, we call this the parent DNA parent DNA molecule. And then after interphase, after replication, before mitosis or meiosis, and these are the daughter DNA cell, daughter DNA. So notice that in the daughter DNA, we have original, original strands, these original yellow strands, but we also have newly formed, newly formed 
DNA. And also newly formed on this side too. So we get two new strands of DNA formed in this process and we have two original strands of DNA. The original strands also end up being called what is known as a template strand and the newly formed strand is the new, is the new strand we're going to concern ourselves with. So every single time a cell is, is divided, what happens is that this DNA strand, this original double-stranded DNA, is essentially split open and a new strand of DNA is made on both sides to replace the one that's missing on each of these, these things. Uh, think about it like uh, you unzip your jacket and then um, instead, of being, instead of unzipping the jacket and then making a copy of the jacket and zipping it back up, you unzip the jacket. No, this is not going to make much sense. But you unzip the jacket and a new side of the jacket forms. And so uh, maybe I'm going uh, you know, to riff out a drawing here. So you have a, a jacket like this. This maybe will have made more sense if it was at winter still. But okay, so you've got a jacket, and let's make this uh, let's make it a yellow jacket, just like this yellow DNA. Okay, at some point in DNA in the DNA process, we're going to duplicate this jacket. We want to be able to duplicate the jacket, but what happens is the jacket gets unzipped, and a new part of the jacket, a new copy of the of the jacket piece that's missing, is formed. Okay. And so a very peculiar process. This was a big debate at the point at the time. Does does DNA replication uh, does DNA, DNA replication mean that the DNA opens up, a new DNA strand is made, and then it closes up again, or does a completely new strand, a new side of the of the DNA get formed? So this this side of the jacket is over here in that in that daughter cell and that side of the jacket's over there in the other daughter cell. And uh, just like in DNA, you have a left and a right side. You'll, you'll have a three to five direction and a five to three direction. Um, you, know, you have the anti-parallel strands. Just like in that, you're going to have uh, the two jackets that are made here have, are made off of opposite sides of that strand. Okay. So this process doesn't happen all at once. It happens across the DNA strand um, where multiple sites are opened up along the DNA strand. These are origins of replication. Essentially, the DNA strand starts to separate at various points. These are very specific points that have uh, very specific sequences of DNA that allow them to open up. And these become the origins of replication. And the hydrogen bonds open up here and the bases separate and DNA strand, DNA replication starts to occur. So here we have the origins of replication. This is a big strand of DNA. Each of these yellow pieces is where an origin happens. A replication complex forms at each of these origins where a bunch of enzymes that are floating around the nucleus at the time of this interface uh, will attach themselves to the DNA strand and then they will start to tear the strand open. So those DNA, uh, those enzymes are here. Remember that enzymes allow chemistry to happen inside the cell. If we look at one set of one one side uh, or one set of DNA strands, uh, a two complementary strands, we can see a replication fork opens up. So this is the the fork. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this with. Out drawing over. So this is a replication fork. It has this sort of general structure like this where you have the motion of DNA replication happening in one direction and along one side there'll be a smooth formation of new DNA and on the other side, we'll explain this in a second, there'll be new DNA forming in pieces. And that'll happen all along the DNA strand as it slowly opens up and splits open. I'm going to post a video that I highly recommend, which is the, uh, the video by the Amoeba Sisters. They have a wonderful animation of this that I can't reproduce here nearly as easily and uh, as uh, nearly as well as their animation. So uh, once you've done with this video, which I'm going to try to leave on the shorter side, uh, please, please, please go watch that video. We would have watched it in class anyways. 
And so the DNA strands will start to be formed together. And at the end of the day, all of these replication forks will start, will catch up to each other and you'll be left with one complete DNA strand at the end or two complete DNA strands. Each of the DNA strands will have one of the original and one new side. And we can see that on the other strand as well. All right. So these replication forks, they move in opposite directions, creating these Y-shaped replication forks, and they proceed in both directions until the bubbles meet. Here's another example. Here's the origins you can see. The origins split apart from one another. This blue stuff is the new DNA daughter strands being formed. Those daughter strands form inside of the, inside of the DNA that's been split open of, between the parental strands and those strands get longer and longer and longer until you are left with two distinct DNA molecules, two daughter molecules. Now I do want to make a little bit of a comment about proteins and enzyme because we're going to be talking about them a lot from now on. So protein is a general name for something that is made of polypeptide, that is known as a polypeptide. Um, so proteins is a general name for molecules made of polypeptide strands. Polypeptides are poly polymer molecules made from amino acids. Uh, hopefully you, uh, you remember the, you might know the idea of amino acids. These are, these are uh, nitrogen carrying molecules essentially essential to life. And so we, we, uh, we get many of these, um, we get many of these from our food. Our body also can produce many of these in uh, various biochemical processes. Um, but we, but your cells essentially are, your, one of the major functions of your cells is to string these amino acids together into polypeptides and then fold those polypeptides up into, to form uh, proteins. These proteins then serve functions in the cell. They might for they might be important to structure. They might be important to catalyzing chemicals, uh, chemical reactions. They might have motor functions. Uh, there's also many more functions that the proteins have. Enzymes are specifically proteins that serve as catalysts. So they are protein, they're a class of protein. An enzyme is just a class, a type of protein, type of protein. So it's a type of protein that specifically serve as chemical catalysts, uh, which means that they help cause chemical changes that would normally not happen. And we've discussed that the DNA strand is held together by uh, what, is, what is known as weak hydrogen bonds actually not held together, but it's held together by some forces and those forces keep the DNA strand together very effectively. But under the effect of an enzyme, those strands can be opened up and those strands can, uh, yeah, those strands can open up and, but only when an enzyme is present or if you do something that would damage the DNA, like hit it with uh, ultraviolet radiation, or boil it, or uh, you know heat it up, uh, you, there's lots of ways to break a DNA strand. But the only way to the but under an enzyme, the strand can be opened and closed uh, catalytically. All proteins, including enzymes, are formed by folding together polypeptides in the endoplasmic reticulum and the other and the Golgi apparatus I believe is also important to that. And the, pro, the polypeptides are then formed but are originally formed by the ribosomes in what is known as translation. This will be um, this will be process two, process number two that we will study. So we're going to be talking a lot about polypeptides and how they're formed in the next section. The differences in protein translation ultimately cause the differences in phenotype because all of our cells' functions are controlled by the proteins. So if you change the protein, you change the phenotype. That's an important concept. Okay, uh, this sheet here that you have in your uh, unit, in your booklet, 
Uh, you can keep track of this here. This is a essentially a list of all the enzymes that I expect you to know and the uh, function of those enzymes as they as it relates to uh, the process of um, as it relates to the process of DNA replication. So again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, and then I expect you to go and watch a couple of the videos that, that I'm going to post that have animated versions of this chemical process. So first step to replicating this DNA strand, first step to ripping this DNA strand apart, once you have the, uh, once you have the binding protein, once you have the, um, once you have the origin of replication and you have the replication complex all assembled is a enzyme called helicase. Helicase's job is to separate the strands of DNA. So helicase is often displayed as a zipper, uh, often described, described as a zipper. So this is the little the little metal flap on your zipper is your helicase that allows your your jacket's DNA is your jacket's double sided zipper to uh, to separate. So this this little zipper flies by, try opening up the DNA strand. Uh, in this example, we are moving in this direction here, so you can see the arrow here. Uh, we are moving this way. This is replication. And that DNA strand is being opened up. And remember that DNA doesn't like to be open. So to keep it open, there are single-stranded binding proteins, SSB. Those single-stranded binding proteins essentially lock onto the sides of the DNA strand and hold it open for a limited amount of time. While this is being unwound, uh, you have a highly wound up structure here. So to unwind it to, or to prevent it from breaking, there is a, another enzyme that travels just in front of the helicase called topoisomerase, and its job is to cut the DNA strand and flip it so that it can avoid the torsion that would be caused by this normal unwinding process. Uh, think about uh, if you've ever had like a, a pile of wires in that desk drawer or whatever, and you pull the wires out and you want to try to separate them. If you just grab two wires and pull as hard as you can, you're probably just going to get a knot. And that's where that's you being just helicase without a topoisomerase. To get the to actually be able to unwind the these uh, the wires, you need to release some of that strain. The exposed nucleotides are unstable and need a partner to stabilize them. But randomly adding bases in the right order would be very unlikely to happen. So there are loose nucleo nucleotic or DNA nucleotides floating around but they aren't likely to join up in the right order or to join together to, uh, to match themselves to the parent strand. So replication will begin when RNA primase uh, finds this loose DNA strand that has this loose single DNA strand and it will, uh, it will attach itself to the DNA strand and, uh, and add to it a little piece of RNA. So I've mentioned before there are two types of nucleic acids in the body. One is RNA and one is DNA. So in this example, we are getting a little bit of RNA paired up with our parental DNA. This is incredibly important because the next enzyme we're going to be talking about has no way of finding DNA unless it is double-stranded. And what you've just created is a little piece of double-stranded DNA, even though it's not double-stranded with the right kind of nucleic acid. So at this point, an a enzyme called DNA polymerase 3, or poly3, is going to attach itself to the DNA strand and start extending from that point where the RNA primer was, start extending the, the RNA primer strand, but using DNA nucleotides. And this will start to go in a specific direction. Here I've sort of drawn how this might look if you got up close. Essentially inside the, inside the DNA polymerase, there's sort of this little, you know, there's going to be some sort of directional hook or a directional sensing tool. It can essentially sense the direction of the phosphate groups and, and sense the direction, sense that three 
to five prime direction and will start to follow along the DNA strand in that specific direction. So in this way, it will read the DNA strand in the three to five direction and it will create new DNA that is opposite to that. So it will create new strands that are in the opposite in the five to three prime direction. So this is the new strand that's forming. So the enzyme can sense the direction of the backbone. It is driven forward by the difference between the three and five prime carbons, kind of like the teeth on a zip tie. So think about with a zip tie, you, uh, as soon as you start to pull it through, you can't pull it backwards because it's essentially locked in. The DNA opens up and, and, a, and a direction of replication start. One of the strands is already arranged in the correct direction that the DNA can follow the helicase, but the other strand is not. So one of the strands is going to be open and the DNA polymerase can simply follow the, uh, follow the helicase. So here we have our helicase here, right, helicase. And the helicase is moving that way. This strand, this DNA polymerase, poly3, is going to move along the three to five tr strand, building DNA in the three to, in the five to three way, and it will follow that helicase. But on the other side of the molecule, it has to move in the other direction. So because it has to move in the other direction, it will finish the job very quickly because it'll quickly, it'll quickly encounter another a chunk of DNA that's already been made. And then the DNA strand will open a little bit and then it will start to copy that piece of strand. And then, oh, it'll open again. So then it'll start to copy that. And every time a new primase has to be put down and a new DNA polymerase. And in this way, it will create little tiny fragments on this side as it tries, as it moves in the opposite direction to the helicase. So this poly is able to move this way, but it will move the, uh, we, I guess we should treat it this way, it'll move the opposite way on the other side. And so you can see it here, and I'm gonna duplicate it so we can remind ourselves of this sort of image. Uh, it's kind of messy. Okay, maybe I'll just delete them. They're not that nice. Okay, so what we end up with is one direction that is in the in the correct direction, and that is known as a leading strand, and then a lagging strand. This strand is opposite the direction of replication, anti-parallel, and so small sections of the strand are replicated at a time, creating fragments of double-stranded DNA. These short segments of double-stranded DNA occur on the lagging strand. They're called Okazaki fragments, named after the, the doctor who found them. And these fragments cannot join together spontaneously. They require the enzyme ligase. And so that's our next enzyme that we're gonna talk about, is ligase that gets in there and joins up these little fragments of DNA. And so here's another version of this. This one, DNA is, we're doing replication in the opposite way. And so the helicase is over here somewhere. This is helicase here. And it's moving this way. And it's opening things up. So here, the, this is poly 3. And it's moving, uh, this poly 3 is moving in the correct direction. This poly 3 is moving in the, in the opposite direction because the strand is opposite. And so the little tiny fragments open and now you can see that there's a bunch of exposed DNA so then that polymerase is going to have to pop in here and do the same job again uh, as soon as there's enough space. Of course there's going to have to be an RNA primase that pops in there first and then a uh, and then the polymerase will pop in. Eventually, a DNA ligase will come in and will join up these Akazaki fragments and finish up that last little space. Any leftover RNA polymerases are eventually rewritten by something called polymerase 1, very similar chemical to polymerase 2, 3, but it, is, it specifically targets those RNA primases. 
and then the DNA ligase searches out the breaks and connects them up. As the new strand of DNA, DNA forms, both polymerase 1 and 3 will move along the strands and proofread them for errors. These errors would normally be mutations, so anything that it misses in this process will be carried through as a mutation. Uh, so I just want to, re to reiterate that changes in a DNA sequence are going to be called mutations, and they may even cause new alleles or traits in the cell and organisms. Some diseases are simply caused by an error during replication that is not repaired, spreading through the cells, uh, through the cell, through the cells through mitosis. So once that error is in this in the DNA, it will be copied the next time that DNA is copied. So the next daughter cells will get that error. Here's the overall uh, process: helicase unwinds the DNA. The single-strand binding proteins hold the DNA strands apart. DNA Primase uh, puts down an RNA primer, then the DNA polymerase, uh, particularly polymerase 3, copies the, or creates a, a complementary DNA strand. On the lagging strand, this happens in stages, and those, those sections have to be sealed up with DNA ligase, as well as the RNA needs to be replaced by polymerase 1. And you can see that listed out there. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. I'm going to in, uh, emphasize again that you need to watch more than one video of this, uh, not just my video, but please watch uh, things like the Amoeba Sisters video, and I'll also link another video as well. Over that, uh, other than that, uh, have some fun with this. Uh, it is a pretty complex topic, but it is very interesting, and uh, hopefully it's interesting to you as well. Have yourselves a great day.